Hello and welcome to Thursday's programme. Coming up tonight, between now and half past six. The mother of two who fears she'll end up on the streets of Plymouth because of the rising cost of renting. The rents are too high, it's unrealistic, we can't afford it. Um, and there's just not enough social housing. There's just, it's a lack of housing out there for people in my position. The largest housing project in our region is going up in Hale, but will local people be able to buy or rent any of the waterfront homes there? The former soldier from North Devon selling his war medals for the sake of his children. I'll do anything to, to secure my children's future. Yes, I'm going to regret it, but it's, it's all about context. It's what's more important. It may be mild and cloudy and a bit damp at times right now, but there are big changes coming this weekend to something quite a bit colder. And we're in Plymouth tonight, where the excitement is building, ready for the big Christmas light switch on of 2021. Good evening. There are fears of thousands of people living in the southwest are facing homelessness because of a chronic lack of social housing and support. A damning new report by the charity Shelter has named Plymouth as among the worst affected areas in the country, with rising rent prices and a shortage of affordable homes, leaving many families struggling this winter. Our reporter Alex Wood has been to meet one family facing eviction from their home. Karen has lived in her privately rented house in Plymouth for the past seven years. She's a mum of two who pays her rent on time every month. But now she and her children are facing eviction after their landlord decided to sell. I was given four months notice to, to find somewhere else to live. The rents have, they're astronomical at the moment, so it's for me to find something similar to what I'm living in now is going to cost me anything from 200 to 500 pound a month extra. Um, and I'm on a low income, so my rent here takes half of my wage. Um, and it's just unrealistic. I just, it's impossible to find private rented. Unfortunately, Karen's case isn't considered a priority, not while she has a roof over her head. They won't take you into consideration until you've got the bailiffs knocking at your door. And that's daunting because I've always paid, you know, my rent on time. This is through no fault of my own and the thought of having a bailiff knock at the door and change the locks and tap you out on the street is, is really stressful. The sad reality is Karen's situation is not unique. In fact, there are more than 7,800 households on the social housing waiting list in Plymouth alone. Only 24 were built between 2019 and 2020. That's according to figures from Shelter. Now, what does all that mean? Well, quite frankly, there aren't enough social houses being built in the city and it's vulnerable families like Karen's who are worst affected. Jack works for the housing charity Shelter. He says spiralling rent prices are forcing local people out of their areas. The need is increasingly severe and it is starting to reach literally so many people in the city, especially after COVID when we have seen people out of work and relying more and more on the state to help get them through that system. If a government really wants to level up communities like Plymouth, they need to invest in social housing. It's a strong message, but will it be heeded and at what cost? Building houses takes time, but that's a luxury Karen and families just like hers simply cannot afford. Alex Wood, ITV News, Plymouth. Well, for more on what's being done to help people like Karen, here's an update from our political correspondent, David Wood. The government has been very critical of the shelter report and saying that the figures in it are misleading. A white paper, a plan, if you like, from the government that's out aims to build many more social homes and, in fact, build many more homes right across the country every year as part of a way out of the ongoing housing crisis. But a statement from the government's housing department says the government is delivering more social homes every year and reducing waiting lists for them. It's reduced them by more than 600,000. And actually, in the last decade, the statement goes on to say 8,600 affordable homes have been built 
in Devon alone and that £12 billion has now been allocated to build yet more affordable homes over the next five years. For its part, a statement from Plymouth City Council says that it wants to work with housing providers to build more affordable homes both for buying and for rent. The statement goes on to say Plymouth is not a social rent eligible area, which means there is less central funding available for housing developers to build new homes for social rent. Despite this, it says we have been proactive in helping to deliver 874 social rent homes in the last 10 years. In addition, there are 66 social rent homes currently under construction and 137 in the pipeline to be built in the next few years. There is, though, an acceptance, I think, from all political parties that housing and the crisis around it is a significant one and there needs to be a fix for it. It's something the government says that is central to its levelling up agenda, seeing opportunities spread right across the country. And to do that, that means more homes need to be built right across the country. Levelling up will be one of the topics of conversation in tonight's West Country debate. So do join me for that after news at 10. David Wood there. Well, meanwhile, one of the largest building projects in the southwest is underway in Hale. North Quay will have 500 homes, many amenities and regenerate the harbour for the fishing industry. But locals are concerned they're being priced out with some homes on the market for more than £1 million. Pounds. Well, for more on this, Marina Jenkins is live in Hale for us tonight. So, Marina, the uh, development seems to be getting a bit of a mixed reaction. Yes, well, for a long time, the money and the attention has gone across the bay. St Ives has been the popular destination, so much so a ban was put in place on selling new homes as second homes. Well, now that attention has come to hail. And there is some concern from local people here that that drive for second homes could happen here too. However, there are a lot in favour of this development at North Quay, including the mayor, who says Hale has been forgotten for far too long and this development is needed to bring it in to the 21st century. This is a metropolis in the making. Hales Harbour, once a thriving industrial port, has been derelict for decades. Until now. New hotel, two cinemas, 140 artists are coming. Lots of local businesses, we've got a local gin distiller, restaurants. Keep the full fishing fleet, we want to expand that and we're trying to keep everything very much Cornish. The World Heritage Site has had many owners over many years. This has concerned local fishermen, not knowing if new development could push them out of their livelihoods. But that worry is now fading as money is being put into quayside infrastructure. We've got facilities now. We didn't have facilities in the beginning. New shed, storage shed facilities. They've given us this key and a bit more, uh, which is fantastic. I think the fishing industry is pretty important for this, for the town, for the county. North Quay is the biggest building project in the southwest. The town mayor believes a development of this size and vision is long overdue in Hale. The development of new modern buildings uh, which will hopefully take us into the 21st century. And Hale is full of niche little shops and businesses. And hopefully that will continue down onto North Quay and will create a vibrant uh, a town centre uh, for continuation and success of Hale. Once complete, the development will have 500 homes, some costing more than £1 million. 96 will be affordable. These will be ring-fenced for local people. We have some of the more expensive homes. Truthfully, that enables us to be able to build the social side. So you have a complete mix. Without affordable houses here, being all different tenures from rental right through to shared ownership, shared equity, I'm adamant that those will go to local people. On the high street, opinion is split. Does West Cornwall really need more pricey properties and second homeowners? It's a really expensive development. It'd be all right if local people could afford it. It's nice that they, they're um, rebuilding the quays as well. I'm very sceptical, actually. I don't think the traffic infrastructure can handle it. It was nice to see a good development and bringing things to the area. This estate agent has never seen so many homes on sale in the town. Sean Harvey Wood says North Quay is sparking a lot of interest. 
It's an offering that has never been seen before, not only in Hale, but in, in West Cornwall. Every new home development is going to bring its fair level of controversy, and that's something that we do have to manage expectations on. Um, reassure local people um, that we're not taking the culture of the town away. Um, we're hopefully adding to it. A town known for its illustrious mining history, now a new vision for its future is taking shape. Marina Jenkins... ITV News. Somerset County Cricket Club has condemned the racist language that player Jack Brooks used in historic social media posts. The comments that date back to 2012 were made when Brooks was playing for Yorkshire, who are currently at the centre of a racism investigation. Sam Mangat is live in our newsroom with more on this. Sam, what's the latest on this story this evening? Well, John T, Somerset's investigation into their players' past behaviour it had two parts. And as you say, Jack Brooks' time at Yorkshire in 2012 is the centre of this investigation. Firstly, the club looked into two social media posts he made which used racist language and then also claimed that he was involved in bringing the nickname Steve for an overseas player against their will. In a statement, Somerset said, Somerset said it has spoken to Brooks and there's no doubt that the comments are unacceptable. It then went on to say the club has considered a number of factors, including no evidence of repeated documented behaviour of this kind, the contrition shown by Jack throughout the process, feedback received from recipients of the social media posts and his commitment to his own personal development. Given these considerations, the club has decided to reprimand Jack, remind him of his responsibilities and require him to participate in extensive training on equality, diversity and inclusivity. Well, Brooks added that it wasn't his intention to cause distress to anyone and in his own statement he said, I'll ensure that my actions and language are never brought into question like this again. I want to be clear and give an unequivocal apology to anybody who has ever been upset or offended by my actions. I am genuinely sorry. Well, these are the sorts of incidents that we've been hearing a lot about in the past week. And it's really clear now that cricket has a lot of soul searching to do. Sam Mangat, thank you. Now the ITV News continues with the national and international stories at 6.30. Mary Nightingale has the details. Coming up in the programme, the Prime Minister's accused of a betrayal over rail after scaling back promised improvements. HS2 will not now be built up to Leeds, nor will there be a new line from Leeds to Manchester. But can other upgrades make up for it? Also ahead, a special report on England's struggling maternity wards as staff shortages bite. Plus, Lady Gaga are on the emotional roller coaster of her latest film. This movie is very funny and it's entertaining and it's, it's beautiful and it's sad and it's wild and it's a ride. That and more at 6.30. Join me then. We're still ahead on our programme before half past six. Excitement is building in Plymouth ahead of the big Christmas lights. Switch on will be live in the city in a few minutes' time. And also coming up, Charlie's at the Metal Fist for us. How's it looking then, Charlie? Uh, well, mild as it has been for ages, really. But there are some blues on the map and they are working towards us. Find out when they arrive in a few minutes' time. But first, one of the most decorated soldiers of the modern era is to auction off his medals to pay for his children's future. Sergeant Major John Thomas, a Royal Marine commando who lives in Barnstable, has fought enemy forces in Afghanistan and Iraq and has been repeatedly recognised for his bravery in combat and for saving the lives of his comrades. Bob Cruz went to meet him. Sergeant Major John Thompson has been in the Royal Marines for 23 years. A heavy weapons specialist, he's done four tours in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, seen service in Northern Ireland too. He's described as one of the most decorated soldiers of the modern era. It was on his second tour in Afghanistan in 2007 with 4-2 Commando that he showed extraordinary courage when the patrol he was commanding was ambushed by the Taliban. Just turned to my driver and I said, I think it's going to kick off in a minute. And then it just went crazy mortars um, rapid fire from AK-47 and uh, RPGs just flying everywhere and they, they, they were hitting the vehicles they were hitting the ground they were exploding in the air we can't turn around we can't go back because that's blocked by all the vehicles behind us so we're just in this killing area trying to fight multiple firing points in in every angle in front of us and to the left and to the right 
it's it's a really charged environment. I don't know why I'm not dead. He was awarded the conspicuous gallantry cross for his actions in that battle, the second highest honour after the Victoria Cross. But he's now selling all seven of his medals. As a single parent coming out of the armed forces next month, he needs to try to raise money to give his children opportunities and a home for the future. I'll do anything to, to secure my children's future. Now I could keep the medals, and there could be a family heirloom that goes down and down and down, and that's lovely. Yes, I'm going to regret it, but it's, it's all about context. It's what's more important. The medals are expected to sell for more than £120,000 because of the rarity of the conspicuous gallantry cross. Very few have been awarded, um, mostly uh, generally for Afghanistan, uh, some for Iraq and one or two, a couple for uh, Sierra Leone. And... Um, and it has now become effectively as almost as good as a Victoria Cross. For most of us medal collectors, we would only dream of having uh, a group of medals like this in our collection. It's not quite the same as having the originals, but he does have a set of replica medals to keep. And it's lovely to show my children because they're extremely proud of their daddy. The original medals, he hopes, will be going to somebody who will look after them for the future and act as custodian of the story of his distinguished military career. Bob Cruz, ITV News, Barnstable. Yeah, what a fantastic achievement, but uh, shame to see them go. Now, it is uh, claimed years of underfunding and a pandemic have taken their toll on our social care system. The current government says it's investing £5.4 billion over three years, but is it enough to fix a system many believe is broken? Well, ITV's Tonight programme is investigating. Sarah Colley reports. Whether it's supplied by councils or independent providers, for the workers who deliver care, it is a demanding job. It's 6.25 in the morning and I'm just about to set off to go to work. Um, I have 29 calls to complete today by 10 o'clock tonight. Courtney is on a run of five days of 15-hour shifts. Morning and lunch was quite hectic this morning. Due to staff sickness, I had to do a couple of calls of my own. Around a million people need publicly funded social care in a care home or their own home. In October, the Care Quality Commission said we'd see a tsunami of unmet need because of staff shortages. The government's Made with Care campaign aims to fill 100,000 job vacancies. Currently we have 25 staff, we have six vacancies, we are all working flat out. Across the UK, 44% of people in care homes pay the full cost of care themselves. Jimmy from Yeovil was one of them. We were paying £1,400 a week for my dad's care. At one point they suggested we needed one-to-one -one care and that was going to be an extra £12,000 a month. It meant the family had to make the difficult decision to sell his home to fund his care. Sadly, Jimmy passed away in February, just a few months after the family home was sold. I think my dad would just be turning over in his grave if he knew. From October next year, government reforms mean no one will have to pay any more than £86,000 in their lifetime towards the cost of their care. But there's a caveat to the new reforms. The cap on care costs only will cover personal care costs, so the very basics of living, getting up, getting dressed, eating, going to the toilet. It wouldn't cover wider social care services, so help going shopping or help with going on public transport, for example. Government reforms paid for by our national insurance are expected to raise £36 billion, with over £5 billion going to social care in England. But some say it doesn't go far enough. Billions of pounds to bring the, the pay structures up to make it a worthwhile career where people really want to stay and really want to develop. Courtney has just finished her last shift of the week. It really does take it out of you, but the most rewarding thing is, is knowing that everyone's been seen to and looked after the way they should be. It's likely we'll all rely on the work of carers at some point in our lives, and it's hoped the new reforms will improve things. But the worry is that it could be too little, too late. Sarah Colley, ITV News.
That programme is on at half past seven this evening. Quick bit of sport for you because Exeter City manager Matt Taylor has said an honest mistake is the reason his team will have to replay their FA Cup tie against Bradford City. The Grecians won Tuesday's game 3-0 in extra time but used a sixth substitute with cup rules only allowing five. The replay is going to take place on the 30th of November at St James Park. Now around 14 million people in the UK are disabled and many say they continue to encounter harmful stereotypes and barriers to accessibility. Well today is the start of UK Disability History Month which aims to celebrate the lives of disabled people and make sure that they are treated equally in all areas of life. Catherine Walker has this report. Challenging stereotypes can be frustrating for Scarlett in Exeter. She lives with severe chronic pain and often comes across outdated and offensive attitudes towards disability. Being a young person with a disability and being told I don't look disabled because I'm too young to have a disability is probably the most frustrating thing that I do come across. Only recently I was questioned at the pharmacy collecting my medication and told, are you sure this is for you because you look too young to be needing this medication, which obviously is very, very upsetting. It's these attitudes that inspired Richard to take action. He founded UK Disability History Month to raise awareness of the barriers faced by the disabled community. The, the whole point of Disability History Month is to at least once a year put a, a focus, though we would like it all through the year, a focus on disabled people, there are 14 and a half million disabled people, according to the government, in our country. That's just under one in five. And most of them are working and getting on with their lives, having families, doing all sorts of things. But they carry, particularly for the 80% who have hidden impairments, the extra burden of having to deal with other people's attitudes. UK Disability History Month will run from the 18th of November to the 18th of December. This year's themes will explore hidden disabilities as well as disabled sex and relationships. The aim is to celebrate the lives of disabled people now and in the past and to explore what more can be done to make sure disabled people are treated more equally in all areas of society. Disability Studies at the Academy of the 21st Century. Anna is a law professor at the Centre for Disability Studies. She says we need to understand the history of disabled rights to help inform future decision making. Disability rights to be free from discrimination only came into force 25 years ago. That's very, very recent in some ways. And we're, we're thinking very much about agendas such as climate change. How does disability fit into those kind of agendas? How was disability impacted by the, the big things that have been happening on a global scale. Um, how can we ensure that there's more emphasis on disability inclusion in, in everything else that's going on? Because if unless that happens, we're going to go backwards. Hi guys, I'm so excited to tell you there's UK Disability History Month. It's those conversations around inclusion that TikTok star Shelby wants to highlight. She uses her social media platform to challenge misconceptions around disability. So what does UK Disability History Month mean to you? I feel like it's a month where disabled people can finally use their voice and they should be heard by everybody, like no matter what. Like a lot of people are scared to say the word disabled. They want to like change it or the words like that, but disabled isn't a dirty word. Like people need to like understand that and a lot of disabled people want to call themselves disabled, like we're not ashamed of that or scared of that. And that's one of the aims of the next four weeks, to challenge stereotypes about disability and learn how everyone can be a better ally. Catherine Walker, ITV News. Now brace yourself because in just a few minutes time the Christmas lights are going to be switched on in Plymouth marking the start of the countdown to this year's festivities. Yeah, after a break forced by the pandemic tonight the button will be pressed by NHS staff who've been working to keep people safe. Well Kate is live there for us tonight. Kate I'm guessing lots of excitement there.
lovely and they're very excited because we are just moments away from those lights being switched on. Sparkly new lights, in fact. But it's actually this year they've been switched on by some people that are rather special. People I think we're very thankful for this year, our local NHS staff. They're actually up on the stage at the moment getting ready to, to uh, plunge the plunger, but I caught up with them a little bit earlier. I'm very humbled to be here on behalf of everybody that's contributed over the last 18 months. Private sector, public sector, people on furlough that have come in and helped out. An amazing turnout from everybody and the multi-agencies as well. I'm talking of the whole team, Girish, you know, your colleagues nominated you to do this. How does that feel? I'm, I'm very humbled with this. I'm, it's a huge privilege to be here and the time to say thank you to each and every one of them, the doctors, the nurses, allied healthcare professional, health and social care staff. They all put themselves in the front line. They went above and beyond the call of duty to look after each other, to represent all of them, to be here. It's a moment. It's a huge privilege. Thank you, everyone. That's Thank lovely. And, and Naomi, if I can bring you forward a little bit. Um, tell us what, a little bit about the work that you've been doing over the last 18 months. Um, well, I normally work in emergency care, but I've been working on the COVID wards as part of the therapy rehab team. Um, and it has been an amazing experience. Also, it's had its sad times. Um, but as a team, we've really worked hard and tried to achieve the best for those patients. And we've seen some amazing work and people just give so much because they just want the best for their patients and the outcomes for them. Well, some really inspirational people there. It was an absolute privilege for me to talk to them. We've been very entertained here this evening. We've had local school kids, Disney princesses, Father Christmas is now up on stage and we are just moments away, as I said, from those Christmas lights being switched on for 2021. A big event for the city and everyone here absolutely loves it. But you'll have to join us at the end of the programme when we'll be able to show you those lights. Kate, thank you very much. Yeah, we will hopefully show them a little bit later. Yeah, before we do, though, we're going to get you uh, the weather forecast for the next couple of days. Charlie at the Met Office for us this evening. Charlie, we know it's been warm for the last few days. You've hinted that could be changing, though. Yeah, I think it's only a couple of days away. Today, though, Merrifield and Somerset got up to 14 Celsius once again. And until we get rid of this high pressure, the mild air you can see wrapped up in it and those light winds, nothing much will change. But on Sunday, this cold front starts to sweep through. It pushes that uh, high pressure away and it allows some colder air to flood in from the north. But temperatures are only going to drop down to, well, probably average really for the time of year. But relative to how it has felt, 9 Celsius and a bit of a breeze from the north will feel pretty chilly. But the story doesn't end there because we head a week in advance. Well, these charts are here, not normally what I would show. This is a forecast model that looks a little bit further ahead. So the certainty is not high, but you can see some darker blues and purples are flooding down. So something even colder, perhaps, by this time next week. Back to today, though, our cameras were out in Brixham, enjoying some of the weather from the here and now. A bit of sunshine there, which looked absolutely incredible. I loved that part of the coastline. Lovely walks around. I think, though, it looked a little bit warmer than it may have actually been. Feels like home, whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps. Sponsors ITV West Country Weather. Well, as we head towards the weekend, the weather will stay pretty quiet, really. Not huge amounts of sunshine, but it should stay mostly dry and, yeah, pretty mild for the time being. But those changes, something colder occurring during the course of this weekend. But for now, high pressure is still with us. That's why the weather's quiet, that's why the winds are light, but it's also why it's quite mild. A lot of warmer air just sort of rotating around that. But once this cold front starts to work through during the course of Sunday, that's when we start to tap into these northerly winds. So, yeah, some breezier conditions and some colder air but not the case for this evening. It's still pretty dry out there. There's a lot of cloud around. There'll be some hill fog, I think, across the moors and perhaps the occasional spit and spot of patchy light rain where that cloud stays thick enough overnight. Mild as well. Temperatures down to 10 or 11 Celsius, so a bit milder than it was last night. And then Friday's sort of a repeat performance of today's weather in many respects. It'll be pretty dry. There'll be a lot of cloud around. I think some of that low cloud and hill fog will lift and there'll be a couple of breaks developing, some sunshine in the afternoon. A few of us will still have a little bit of patchy light rain, perhaps more likely along the northern coastline, I would have thought. Temperatures again, though, happily up to around 13 or 14 Celsius. Some pretty quiet seas as well, high tide at St Mary's, quarter past four in the morning and just after half past four in the afternoon. 
And then the weekend, well, stays pretty cloudy. On Saturday, not huge amounts of sunshine, maybe a little bit of dampness around. Similar sort of thing on Sunday as that cold front starts to work its way through. Could be a bit wet down towards the south coast. Brighter into next week, but also a lot colder. Temperatures generally in single figures, but with a bit more sunshine around, might see some more views as Denise saw not too far from Penzance. It's a huge cloudscape at Perinutno. Valent sponsors ITV West Country Weather. Charlie, thanks very much. Now, just before we go, let's take you back to Plymouth where the Christmas lights have just been switched on. Looks uh, lovely there, doesn't it? Lots of people still gathering uh, both to see the lights and to celebrate the NHS workers. The switch on has been dedicated to them and all of their hard work here. Yeah. Very nice. And they're giving us a wave goodbye yeah. as well, yeah. because it is time to say goodbye to all of you at home this evening. I'm back with the late news at half past ten. I'll hand you to Mary Nightingale. From all of us here, bye-bye. Bye-bye.